Welcome to Let's Learn Video Lecture Series for the Works Engineers. Instructions for use. Every topic is being divided into multiple videos to bring in simplicity and to enable the audience to enjoy learning. The texts and data that are being displayed here are for guidance only. For actual practice, references should be made to the original codes, manuals, circulars and letters. Contract Management Contract Management Overview of Contracts from a common man's perspective It is being understood that in every classroom, in every book and in every field the word contracts is being seen through the eyes of an engineer. It is lesser being seen through the eyes of a common man. Come, let's see it from the perspective of a common man. The aim of a contract. The aim of a contract is to get the required quantity of work of specified quality completed within a least possible time at a least possible cost under mutually agreed terms through an able person or firm within the legal framework. Looking at the keywords, let me once again pronounce it. Required quantity, specified quality, least possible time least possible cost, mutually agreed terms, able person or firm, legal framework. All these words look simple. It's from the common man's perspective. When we look at these from the railway engineer's perspective, we have equivalent words for all these simple words. In the upcoming sessions, we'll look at those. Coming to the keywords, we have already had a look at the keywords, those simple terminologies related to contracts. The first word was required quantity. Where will we know about the required quantity of work to be done? In the contracts or in the tenders, there is a separate item called schedule of works or the tender schedule. Next comes the word specified quality. Where do we specify the quality of work that is expected in railways? That is through unified standard specification for works. So, for specified quality, we have to refer to unified standard specification for works. Then comes least possible time. Who fixes the time period for this? The competent authority fixes the time to be taken for completion of this work. In railway terminologies, we refer to it as completion period or the currency of work. Next simple word is least possible cost. For the cost references, that is for the rates for the works to be done, we need to refer to the unified standard schedule of rates of each railways. First, this serves as a base rate. Based on this, the tenderers are being requested to submit their offers at their convenient rates. So, the rates may be, that is, the rates quoted by the tenderers may be more than the rates specified in the schedule of rates or maybe less than the rates that are being quoted in the schedule of rates. Then comes the mutually agreed terms. In railway, no, railway parlances, we call it as conditions of contract. We have two types, that is standard conditions, then special conditions. Next simple word will be able person or firm. We refer to it as the eligibility criteria. Who will be able to do the work? It's being termed as eligibility criteria. Then comes the legal framework. In our terms, that is in railway terms, it is being referred as arbitration and reconciliation. Keywords in revised order. We have already seen the keywords in simple terms. Now we have rearranged them for better understanding. Let's see them one by one. The first one was required quantity. Where do we find the required quantity? In the tender schedule. Initially, when we are at field, we prepare the estimate, that is, the quantity of work to be carried out under each item given in unified standard schedule of rates. If the work to be done is not available in the unified standard schedule of rates, then we go for non-schedule items. So, required quantity. 
then we call it as tender schedule so in the contract what has to be done the work what work has to be done is being listed in the tender schedule the next simple keyword is specified quality for quality we need to refer to the unified standard specification for works in the unified standard specification for works they have mentioned the procedures to be adopted for carrying out each and every item of work that has been included in the unified standard schedule of rates it specifies the quality of raw materials quality of workmanship quality of work to be carried out so this answers the basic question word how how the work has to be done then comes the word able person or firm that is we refer to as eligibility criteria this answers the basic question who who will do the work then comes the word least possible time that is the time required for completion of the works mentioned in the contract we refer it to as completion period or currency of work this answers the basic question then we have mutually agreed terms that is the conditions of contract in railways we have standard conditions of contract and special conditions of contract this consists of all the clauses with emphasis to the rights and responsibilities of railways in completion of the contract work and also the rights and responsibilities of the contractor in completing this contract work the next one is the legal framework we had referred to it as arbitration and reconciliation this is the negative aspect of the contract work if if the contractor fails if the railway pay fails what has to be done those things are covered under the legal framework or the clauses under the heading arbitration now comes the success part the simple keyword now we refer to is least possible cost the least possible cost is being referred to the unified standard schedule of rates we had evaluated the amount of money that is required for completion of the job and we have created a booklet called unified standard schedule of rates and the tenderer will be asked to quote his rates over and above or below the rates mentioned in the unified standard schedule of rates based on this quotes based on the offer sub he submits we would decide the cost for the contract work once the work is being completed to our satisfaction that is as per the specifications mentioned in the unified standard specification of works and the entire quantity of work mentioned in the tender schedule is being completed then it's a big success the contract comes to an end before that we need to pay the contractor for completing the works based on our conditions to the railway satisfaction so this concludes the pre tendering activities then do we have anything else to be done in the post tendering session no whatever we have done now is on paper this has to be translated into physical terms in the real field without any distortions and without any deviations this is the important duty of junior engineer and or senior section engineer now we come to the tenders part this is the first physical step in the contract management or the contract work we invite tenders or we call for bids that is we advertise through local newspapers through internet through notice boards that is the office notice boards in the division offices advertising the requirement or calling eligible people to participate in the tender to submit their bids for carrying out a specific work when we call for the tenders we need to prepare the tender documents what comprises the tender documents the tender documents consists of 
notice inviting tender that is the tender notice this is the one that is being advertised you will find these in the newspapers and in the office notice boards then the instruction to tenderers what has to be done how has to be done where should they submit the tenders how much amount they have to deposit everything will be given in the instruction to tenderers then comes the tender schedule that is the quantity of work to be carried out for each item of work then the specification for each work then the drawings for the work then the conditions of contract all these together comprises the tender document also we'll have to look at the tender form cost and earnest money deposit these two deposits are to be paid by the tenderers even if 100 tenderers participate in the tender each one have to make these payments after opening of the tender that is after finalization of the tender the payments made by the unsuccessful tenderers will be refunded to them the payments made by the successful tenderer will be adjusted towards his security deposit we will have a look at all these terms in the future sessions now in the immediate next immediate session we will get into the conditions of contract in detail as we have already seen conditions of contract has two parts that is standard general conditions of contract and then the special conditions of contract when we come into standard general conditions of contract the conditions laid down in this are general in nature they are applicable to all contract works and these are being issued by railway board when we come to special conditions of contract each condition is specific to each contract work it varies based on nature of work in each contract these are being framed by the engineer in charge duly exercising care for legal and financial repercussions let's go into standard general conditions of contract the latest revision of standard general conditions of contract was made in the year 2019 in the month of september now we are looking into standard general conditions of contract for works contract do we have any other forms of contracts yes we do have service contracts for that we have a separate standard general conditions of contract for service contracts so hereafter we'll refer it to as gcc for works contracts and then gcc for service contracts now in this video we'll be looking into only the aspects of gcc of works contracts only the gcc for works contracts consists of two parts part 1 regulations for tenders and contracts part 2 standard general conditions of contract part 1 consists of nine clauses and six annexures part 2 consists of 64 paras and apart from gcc we should also refer to the latest circulars issued by railway board related to the works contracts we have already seen that part 1 of gcc consists of nine clauses and six annexures for easy understanding we will separate them into different headings as follows first one will be meaning of terms next one is credentials of contractors then tender for works consideration of tenders then the contract documents then comes annexures that is the pro forma for contract documents all these are being mentioned in the part 1 of gcc to be simple first one comes the meanings next the credentials that is the eligibility criteria then the tender for works that is the tender schedule related verses then consideration of tenders that is how will we evaluate the tenders what are our rights to accept or reject an offer submitted by the tenderer then 
After finalization of the tender, what are the contract documents to be executed? The performer of all these contract documents have been given in the part 1 as annexures. Those comprise the 6 annexures. Now, part 2 of Standard General Conditions of Contract. It consists of 64 paragraphs and 10 annexures. Again, for simplicity, we have divided them into different headings. That is, all these 64 paragraphs have been divided into 10 headings. First one is Definitions. It consists of one para. General Obligations. It consists of 17 paras. Execution of Works. 22 paras. Variation in extent of contract, 3 paras. Measurements, certificates and payments, 3 paras. Price variation, 1 para. Maintenance of works and final payments, 7 paras. Labor, 7 paras. Determination of contract, 2 paras. Settling of disputes, arbitration, 2 paras. Altogether, it comes to 64 paras. And then we have 10 annexures. Now we can see that part 2 has the major portion of GCC. In normal terms, tender has been finalized, contract has been issued to the contractor. Now what are the general obligations that are to be carried out by the contractor as well as by the railways? It is being specified under the Heading General Obligations. It consists of 17 paras. And how the work has to be executed? It is specified under the head Execution of Works, consisting of 22 paras. The General Obligation and Execution of Works occupies the major portion of GCC. Then, we have planned for 100% of work. What if the work goes on to 120%? What if the work volume gets reduced to 80%? These are being dealt in the Variation in extent of contract, that is the three paras. Then, when it will be measured, how it will be measured, what are the contract certificates to be issued, when the payments will be made, all these comes under measurement certificates and payments. Next comes the price variation, the price variation clause. This is most important question asked in most of the departmental exams. Then, maintenance of works and final payments. After completion of the work, up to what time the works are to be maintained and after that the final payment will be made. What are those conditions to be fulfilled are mentioned under the maintenance of works and final payments. Then comes the labor component. How they are to be treated, when the wages are to be paid, what are to be verified, all these are mentioned under the head labor. Then determination of contract. Under determination of contract, what if railway fails? What if the contractor fails? What if God puts us under trouble, say like COVID-19 situation, what has to be done? Or if there is a flood, what has to be done? Or if there is a riot, these are beyond the control of railways as well as the contractor. All these are dealt under determination of contract. Then if there is a dispute between both the parties, between the railways and the contractor, how it has to be settled? Those things are dealt under settling of disputes and arbitration. Let's deal the part 1 of GCC in detail. As we have already seen, it consists of 9 clauses and 6 annexures. The first clause consists of meaning of terms. Let's see the most important ones now and rest of it in the upcoming videos. The first one or the most important one is engineer. That is on railway side, who is referred to as engineer, divisional engineer or executive engineer and Senior Divisional Engineer are only referred to as engineers. These people may belong to engineering department, electrical department, mechanical department, whatsoever. Only these people are referred to as engineers. Then when it comes to the contractor's side, we call them as contractor's authorized engineer. Who is a contractor's authorized engineer? A graduate engineer with three years experience in the relevant field of construction work involved in the contract. So from next time onwards, whenever we see a contractor engage an authorized engineer, we should see that the graduate engineer has at least, that is 
minimum experience of 3 years in the relevant field of construction work involved in the contract. So, a person with 3 years experience only should be engaged by the contractor. To sum up what we have seen in this video, we have seen the contract from the common man's perspective, the aim of contract, the simple words, the relevant railway terminologies, then the answer to the basic questions on contract, say what, how, who, when, conditions, failure, success, etc. Then we have seen about the tenders and with emphasis to conditions of contract. When related to conditions of contract, we know that we have standard general conditions of contract as well as special conditions of contract. Then we have seen the two parts of standard general conditions of contract. What are the clauses included in part 1? We have 9 clauses and 6 annexures in part 1 and in part 2 we have 64 paras and 10 annexures. For simplicity's sake, we had compiled them into 10 headings. Hope this video was useful. Thank you. Stay tuned. Stay focused. Save railway money. Serve the nation. Save water. Every dog counts. If you have any queries, mail me at a.s.ramchenai at the rate of gmail.com. Thank you.